All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Fiveable. Uh, my name is Caroline, if you haven't joined in before. Uh, and tonight we will be doing a review of cellular energy, DNA to protein, and a tiny bit of genetics if we have time. I have a feeling we might not. It just depends on how many questions you guys have and how quickly we can move through the material. But there's definitely lots to cover. There's definitely lots to review. The AP exam at this point is about three and a half weeks away. I know you guys probably already know that because um, you're probably anxiously anticipating. Um, but it is my job to make you feel just slightly more at ease with some of this material. So make sure that you ask questions or post questions either in the chat or on the ask a question uh, function of, of um, Crowdcast, sorry, so that uh, I can make sure that I can answer them because again, I want to make sure that I'm best helping you. I will certainly go through the things that I think are most important for you to know for the AP exam on May 13th. But if you need a further explanation, if I'm moving too quickly, too slowly, any of those things, just let me know and I'll navigate and make sure that I can best meet your needs. Okay. Also, thank you. I'm sure for a lot of you, this is your spring break. So thank you for tuning in over your spring break um, and spending some extra time with me um, to get extra help. Um, if you are interested in extra cram sessions, watching my replays, we've reviewed a lot of material since September. If you haven't been with us since September, there's lots of content that you can still um, replay and, and, and access and access my PowerPoint slides. Sign up for a Fiveable Plus membership, um, and I can post the link to that at the end of this session, um, but that will give you access to all of my materials, as well as all the replays so that you can make sure that you're giving yourself the best chance of passing the AP exam in May. All right, it's almost here, y'all, and you will be ready, no doubt. Okay. So where we're going to start today, and again, if you haven't been with us, I can kind of walk you through what we've reviewed so far. So, so far we've covered evolution, so we've gone through microevolution, macroevolution, um, origin of species, things along that nature. Uh, then we moved into talking about more basic cellular structures, um, as well as cellular transport. So a lot of last week we talked about the plasma membrane, different types of transport across the membrane, etc. And then tonight we're going to jump into cellular energy. Um, so you should be familiar with, with organelles. You should be familiar with um, a lot of biochemistry. That's a lot of what cellular energy is, is knowing proteins and um, anions and ions and all sorts of things. Um, but I'll cover the, the most important things that you need to know about cellular respiration uh, and then photosynthesis. And then we'll jump into DNA and then transcription and translation. All right. So cellular energy specifically, we're going to start with cellular respiration. So uh, what is the purpose of cellular respiration? Cellular respiration is a process that we all do. That's really important to know, and it sounds really simple, but students oftentimes forget that plants also go through cellular respiration. So that's a good one to make sure that you're familiar with because they'll oftentimes put in tricky multiple choice questions. It's basically just testing whether or not you know that a plant also goes through cellular respiration. What is cellular respiration? Well, it's converting food sources into usable energy uh, or harvesting stored energy, you could say. Um, so the most basic form of this is going to be converting glucose into ATP, uh, which is our cellular money or our cellular energy that we're able to use in order to do things in our body. Um, and glucose is uh, breaking down of glucose is going to be the simplest example of cellular respiration. So you can see the overall formula here. We have glucose and oxygen uh, being converted into carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. That happens in a three-step process, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain, all of which I can explain in a little bit more detail. What I will say is you need to know more the broad overall purposes of each of the three steps, um, not the intricacies of each step. And I can show you, um, I should pull that up and I can, I can post the link in a second. Uh, a free response, I believe from 2015, a long free response that had to do with cellular respiration. And I can show you what, what College Board actually provided to students as things that they were not required to memorize. They just needed to apply and understand the concepts behind the processes. Let me find that really quick. I believe it was 2015. Um, and I can pull that up so that you can also be looking at that and referencing that. Let me just make sure I'm talking about the right thing. So all the past forever's free responses are available on the internet as well as their um, answer keys. Okay, yes, here we go. You can always use this as a reference point. Uh, you can take a look at the rubrics. I always tell my students to look as many, at as many rubrics as possible um, before they take the AP exam, just so that they know what College Board expects of them. Because some of these points are very obscure. Um, you also have to remind yourself that you don't 
you don't need to get every point. Oftentimes on these long 10 point questions, the average is a three or a four out of 10. So if you can get a three or a four, then you're shooting for a three. Um, so you don't need to panic about getting every single point possible. But if you take a look at free response question number two in uh, AP, the AP exam from 2015, which I just posted, um, you'll see a little bit more about the information that's provided to you from College Board. Okay, so that's just to put your mind at ease because I will go through this relatively quickly, but it's only because you only need to know the higher overarching topics. Okay, so again, three, three main steps, glycolysis and pyruvate oxidation, the Krebs or citric acid cycle, interchangeable names there, then the electron transport chain, which is going to be um, oxidative phosphorylation at the end. Okay, so we'll start with uh, glycolysis and pyruvate oxi oxidation. So things that you need to know is that this is the most evolutionarily ancient pathway. So almost every living thing on Earth goes through glycolysis in the same fashion with very, very similar, if not identical, enzymes. Okay, so that's something that's important to know. Um, it comes up a lot. It makes sense because it's the first pathway that it would be the most evolutionarily conserved. Um, but that comes up actually relatively frequently on the AP exam, so it's a good fact to know. Again, done by all organisms, can occur without a mitochondria, can occur without oxygen. So even the bacteria that live inside of your gut and are in an anaerobic environment, they're still going through glycolysis and that's how they're producing their energy. So this is actually a snippet then of that 2015 free response question so you can take a look. You'll see glycolysis and pyruvate oxidation up in the upper left-hand corner here. And I can go through the process generally with you, but glucose is being broken down. So glucose is a six carbon, and we're gonna be counting carbons here pretty frequently, six carbon um, molecule that's being broken down into two three carbon molecules called pyruvate. Okay, and uh, in the process of breaking bonds, we're going to release some energy. So you can see those two ATP there. That's actually a net gain. So we actually invest two ATP and we make four ATP for a net gain of two ATP from this process. We also form two electron carriers. So in case you've forgotten, NAD plus is an empty electron carrier. NADH is a full electron carrier. And the reason why we would be filling up these electron carriers is because we're breaking bonds. Bonds are just shared electrons, and so if we can break bonds, we're releasing electrons and we're filling up electron carriers. Those will be used later in the electron transport chain. More on that in a bit, okay? So in this process, we're making a little bit of energy. If you're an anaerobic organism or a bacteria, this is really where you thrive. This is where you're making all of your ATP. If our muscles go into anaerobic mode, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, then we would make ATP just solely through this pathway. Uh, and then we're also making these electron carriers, which again will be used later. So that's the first part of this process. That's where the energy actually comes from and the electrons come from in this process. Um, and then we further oxidize, and hopefully you know this from chemistry, um, but oxidation is loss of electrons. So we're gonna further kind of break down pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, which is just an in-between molecule. Um, that's kind of at the end of glycolysis. Uh, and you'll see that we release, where did, where did those other two carbons go? They were released as carbon dioxide. Um, so this is kind of an important thing to know. Carbon dioxide is not related to oxygen at all, um, even though they're both being, you know, obviously transported through the same respiratory tract. Carbon dioxide does not come from oxygen. Oxygen does not come from carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, you want to think of a carbon-containing thing. That's where we're getting that from. Uh, and it comes from the breakdown of glucose okay so oxygen is going to be a whole other beast that we'll talk about in a little bit just a friendly reminder because students do oftentimes think the carbon dioxide is coming from oxygen it's just not the case okay so those are, this is this initial process um, so the important thing here and what's going to happen naturally for all oxygen breathing organisms who can go through the electron transport chain is that those electron carriers that NAD plus needs to be recycled and what I mean by that is let me get my little pointer out. This NAD plus is being filled up with electrons. And in biology, electrons are gonna be carried on that hydrogen molecule. So we have an electron and a proton binding together there. Okay, and we see this here. And um, we're gonna continuously be filling up electron carriers, right? But this is a limiting reagent. And if you have chemistry experience, then you're familiar with limiting reagents, okay? And so we will run out of these eventually. So we cannot break down glucose forever unless we recycle our electron carriers. So unless we have them drop off their electron so that they can be refilled, okay? 
there's a couple different ways that we can do this. Naturally, for again, oxygen breathing organisms who have uh, the capability of going through the electron transport chain, our electron carriers will be emptied naturally on the electron transport chain, and then they can go back to be refilled, no problem. But if oxygen is not present, or for organisms that aren't gonna go through the electron transport chain, they need to be recycled elsewhere so that they can continue to be refilled, they can continue to make ATP through glycolysis. Okay, so the two major pathways here are alcohol fermentation and lactic acid fermentation. So on the left, you see alcohol fermentation. Many yeast and bacteria go through this. It's how we get beer and wine. So we're thankful for these microorganisms and their need to recycle their electron carriers. But after glycolysis, you can see this process right here where we're recycling the electron carrier. We're actually dropping that electron off onto acetyl aldehyde and therefore converting it into ethanol, which is alcohol. And then these electron carriers that are empty can then go back and be refilled in glycolysis. And I like this graphic because it does a good job of showing the need and the reason and, and how this is actually happening with the recycling of the electron carriers. Now what us humans do when we're working out and we run out of oxygen in the deep inner cores of our muscles because we're just using so much oxygen, we're making so much ATP, is we will switch into anaerobic respiration, which is what this is, and we'll actually ferment lactic acid, um, which depending on the scientist is what makes you sore. Um, in your muscles. And so that builds up because we are dropping off electron carriers on lactate, which is gonna form lactic acid, um, and therefore could potentially make us sore. And then those electron carriers can be recycled. Um, but when you're doing anaerobic activities, like you're sprinting um, or you're lifting weights, right, where you're using your muscles so much that you're actually running out of oxygen in them, um, that's when this lactic acid starts to build up because we still need to recycle our electron carriers. Okay. So it's another kind of important thing. It's not like solely um, a glycolysis situation because obviously it goes a little bit beyond that, but it's something important to know about for sure. Um, and, and we do this too, right? So it's not just microorganisms, although those are most common. Uh, we also do, do fermentation as well. Oops. Eek. Oh no. Shoot. Okay. So I'll briefly then walk you through <laughs> the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain as well. So I'm going back to this slide. So there's not a whole lot that you need to know about these things. So I don't want you to panic and feel like you have to memorize. You certainly don't need to know all these intermediates. So hopefully your teacher has told you that. Unless you're going to be a medical student or major in some crazy biology one day. Like I was a microbiology major in college and I did not need to know these intermediates. So do not panic. Um, but Krebs cycle, what you do need to know is that we're breaking down our carbon containing um, compounds even further, okay? So we're breaking more bonds. With breaking more bonds, that means we're releasing more energy. But most importantly, and the most important thing that you can remember about the Krebs cycle is we're, for, we're filling a lot of electron carriers. So we'll see eight electron carriers being filled around this cycle as we're breaking things down. Okay, so we have this acetyl-CoA entering. Again, we're releasing this as carbon dioxide as the cycle continues. Okay, and we're filling up electron carriers as bonds are being broken. Remember, bonds shared electrons, they're being released. They're being picked up by these electron carriers, which will eventually be recycled via the electron transport chain. And then we're also releasing this carbon dioxide, which is obviously what we're exhaling. Um, scientists have done really cool experience, experiments where they will radioactively, um, radioactively tag carbon in glucose and they'll put it in like breakfast cereal and you'll eat that glucose and then they'll measure your your exhalations and they'll actually be able to detect all of the radioactivity that went into you coming back out as carbon dioxide so all the glucose that goes in all the carbon that goes in as glucose is coming right back out as carbon dioxide when we exhale so you might be exhaling your dinner right now or your lunch um, but that's what's coming back out um, as a toxic waste product and we can we can talk more about breathing regulation in a little bit so we're forming a little bit of energy. The most important thing to remember about the Krebs cycle is that we're forming a lot of electron carriers because that's what's going to give us the bang for our buck in step three, the electron transport chain. So what's happening here? And again, this is the exact diagram that was given to students in 2015. So they had all this information in front of them. You just need to know a little bit more about what's happening and why. And really what's happening here is that electrons are being dropped off in the electron transport chain, which should make sense, right? So you can see this NADH is releasing its H. With that, we get protons, which are gonna be pumped out of the membrane, which is not where they wanna go. So if you joined me last week, 
these um, protons are being pumped against their will. This would be like a, an example of active transport going from low concentration to high concentration. But thankfully, the force of the electron that's also being donated is going to be enough to force those hydrogens against their concentration gradient. And then this guy can go back to either glycolysis or the Krebs cycle to be refilled. So we've dropped off the hydrogen ion, the proton or hydrogen ion, same difference. And that's being pumped to the exterior part of the membrane. And you can see that there's a much higher concentration of hydrogens outside than inside. Okay. And then the electron that's been dropped off is being dragged through the membrane to more and more electronegative compounds until it gets to the most electronegative compound, which is oxygen. Uh, and if you know your periodic trends, you know this to be true. Okay, so oxygen is very electron hungry and it is the granddaddy of them all waiting at the end. This is literally why you breathe in. Okay, so that oxygen can serve as the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain, which is what it's doing right here. And when oxygen binds with the electrons, it'll also bind with some free protons in the area and form water, which is where we get water from in cellular respiration. Okay, now the end goal, which is also not shown here, um, is that these protons will come through an enzyme called ATP synthase. And remember that all enzymes end in ACE. ATP synthase is the enzyme ACE that synthesizes synth ATP. So it makes sense. The name makes sense. And these ions will go through a process called chemiosmosis, which I can write in the chemiosmosis. Right? And chemiosmosis is the process of hydrogen ions, or any ion for that matter, flowing from a high to a low concentration. So it's similar to osmosis, which we talked about last week. Okay, so those ions are going to be flowing through this enzyme. And the actual force of those ions flowing back from a high concentration to a low concentration is enough to provide energy for phosphorylation of ADP. So we'll have phosphorylation of ADP into ATP. Phosphorylation just means adding a phosphate. So we're going from adenosine diphosphate ADP to ATP, adenosine Triphosphate, adding phosphate. And, uh, and therefore making energy. And again, that's through the process of chemiosmosis with those hydrogen ions. David, I see you asked a question. Sorry that I missed it. What is needed for glycolysis? So for glycolysis, we really just need glucose and a few key enzymes. You do not need to know the enzymes that are responsible. Uh, we also need empty electron carriers as well as ADP, which is what I was just telling you, is adenosine diphosphate. So we need kind of the building blocks of ATP and electron carriers. So ADP and phosphate and NAD plus. Uh, and then we just need glucose and some enzymes. But the enzymes you are not responsible for knowing, which is the good part. But if you take a look at the left hand side of this figure, you'll see all the reactants of glycolysis. Hopefully that helps answer your question. Okay. Those are the major takeaways. Any questions there? We're okay with chemiosmosis. We're okay with phosphorylation, some key vocab. Again, I don't want you to feel like you need to know all the intricacies of these cycles because you really don't. You just need to be familiar with why things are happening. Like what are those electron carriers gonna be used for? Where does the energy come from? The breaking bonds. Okay. Great. Well, we'll keep cruising then. This will keep us on schedule. Maybe we'll actually get through everything tonight. Stay tuned. Um, students really seem to like um, photosynthesis better than cellular respiration. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because we talk about it or in my class we talk about it afterwards and it's similar. Um, but for whatever reason, photosynthesis seems to be more of a crowd favorite. So hopefully we can get, get through this. No problem. Um, so photosynthesis is going to be the basis of all energy on Earth, which is really great, or all usable energy that we're, we're using. Um, and that's converting light energy into chemical energy, which is a really amazing process. Thank you, plants. Thank you, photosynthetic bacteria. You make the world go round. But they, in our simplified example, they're gonna convert light into glucose uh, or other sugar compounds or storage compounds. Um, but for, for sim simplification, uh, we'll just talk about light to glucose, which is truly amazing. You'll notice that uh, the formula here is the reverse of cellular respiration, and that's true. Um, so if you ever forget, this is an easy way. If you can remember one of the two, you'll know that the other process is the reverse. Just don't think that the process is actually the same because it's it's not at all, um, but the products and reactants are going to be 
uh, the reverse of one another. So we have carbon dioxide and water with the help of some sunlight being converted into glucose and oxygen. And that's truly incredible to think about carbon dioxide um, actually being converted into this high energy molecule that gives us life and ATP and all sorts of crazy things. So here's how it happens. Two major steps instead of three, we have the light reactions and then we have the calcium. So here are the light reactions. And again, you do not need to be familiar with all of these things. Basically what you need to know, so there's a couple of important things. So we have two photosystems here, PS2 and PS1. Photosystem two, photosystem one. Why does photosystem two come first? Great question. It's because scientists discovered photosystem one first and then they didn't rename it when they discovered that there's actually a photosystem that comes prior. So there's your fun fact of the day. Um, but basically, what happens in the light reactions is that light is involved. So surprising, but true. Uh, and light is going to strike our photosystems. They're gonna, it's going to specifically strike a chlorophyll molecule. And chlorophyll is a really important pigment. I'm sure you've heard of it. Chlorophyll. Uh, one of my favorite scenes from Billy Madison, which is one of my favorite movies. Hopefully, uh, there's some Billy Madison fans out there. Uh, watch it on Netflix, but it's great, uh, is, a, is a chlorophyll uh, joke. So, you know, go go watch it if you have free time, which I'm sure you have lots of with the AP exam coming up. But what's happening here is light is striking a chlorophyll molecule. And when it does so, it excites an electron up into a higher energy level, and it's therefore going to be lost from that chlorophyll molecule and from that photosystem. So that kind of spurs a spontaneous reaction. So if we start over here with photosystem two, light is striking the photosystem, and you can see we have an excited electron. That electron is basically going to pop off. It's actually going to go through a mini electron transport chain. Uh, so very similarly to what we just saw with the electron transport chain in cellular respiration, we're actually pumping hydrogen molecules across their concentration gradient. We're going to use them later through ATP synthase to make ATP, which you can see down here. Okay, so that first electron is going to contribute majorly to the production of ATP via the transport of hydrogen ions into uh, the thylakoid, which is where this is taking place inside the chloroplast, um, and uh, we're therefore gonna be able to make ATP because of it. Now, we can't just leave this photosystem to hanging without its electron, right? So it's lost an electron, we do need to replace it. Thankfully, water actually splits itself, and when it does, it replaces the electron, because again, breaking bonds mean we're releasing electrons. Most importantly though, not for the plant, but for us, we're actually gonna release oxygen as a toxic byproduct. Um, so here's oxygen. We also have more hydrogen being donated, which is gonna help us make more ATP. Um, but oxygen is gonna be, again, a toxic byproduct for the plants that they're gonna release, but then obviously we need to breathe and survive, okay? So that's kind of this first part, and that's where the hydrogen comes from to make ATP. We're also gonna make electron carriers during the light reactions, and those are gonna come in a little bit. So we have this electron moving through uh, the electron transport chain that's been lost from photosystem two. Photosystem two is all good because we replaced that electron from water. Then we have photosystem one, which is also struck by photons of light all the time and also loses an electron. Thankfully, this electron traveling from photosystem two is going to replace the lost one. And the last one is just gonna hop right on over onto an electron carrier. And this time, instead of NAD, it's NADP, and we make NADPH from it. Okay, so we're actually creating a, a slightly different electron carrier, NADPH, does the same thing though, and it gets its electron from photosystem one. All of the intricacies of that are not super, super important that you have memorized, but you do kind of need to have an idea of why the light reactions produce both electron carriers and ATP. And I find it's easiest to know those things if you're just familiar with this general process. Why do we need to make ATP and electron carriers? Great question. It's all going to be used in the Calvin cycle. So for light reactions, what goes in? Light, water, ADP, and NADP+. What comes out? ATP, electron carriers, and oxygen. Then comes the Calvin cycle. So the Calvin cycle is really miraculous because it is converting CO2, so our toxic waste that's coming out of our mouth, right? it's a gas, and it converts it into glucose, which is really, really amazing. So the first process is carbon fixation, and fixation is gonna be the term used for any time we're converting something into an organic compound or something that's usable, oftentimes a gas into a solid. So we had nitrogen fixation when we talked about ecology a couple weeks ago, Carbon fixation is gonna convert CO2 into a usable carbon compound, which you do not need to know the name of. Um, Rubisco, 
is the enzyme that converts CO2 into its organic carbon compound. Um, you're wondering why that is an enzyme if it doesn't end in ACE, and it's because Rubisco is an abbreviation for ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase. Does end in ACE. Thankfully, Rubisco is good enough. Again, very important enzyme because it's converting CO2 into a usable carbon compound. Once we get it into a usable carbon compound, we're gonna break and make and do lots of different things using the energy and the electrons from the light reactions, ATP and ADPH. And we're gonna make a molecule of G3P, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. All that means, G3P, is that uh, it's, a, it's a precursor to glucose. It's also the precursor to different starches and cellulose and all sorts of other things that are really, really beneficial. Um, but in our simplified example of just talking about glucose, you just need to know that G3P is then gonna go be converted into glucose. But again, in this process, the major high level things that you need to know, so we're taking a gas, carbon dioxide, we're converting it with Rubisco into uh, eventually G3P or glucose, with the help of the energy and electrons from the light reactions. Okay, so Calvin cycle, what goes in? CO2, ATP, NADPH. What comes out? Glucose, NADP plus, and ADP. I did wanna highlight those because it's really, really important, just like it is for us, um, that the plant is able to recycle their electron carriers and their ADP to be used again. So. The Calvin cycle, or the light reactions, I should say, depend on the Calvin cycle just as much as the Calvin cycle depends on the light reactions because they need to get the electron carriers and the ADP back to the beginning so that it can be reused. Okay, any questions? Okay, we're cruising tonight. Cool, so this is, this is photosynthesis in a nutshell then. We have sunlight coming in, we have our energy building or light reactions. Uh, in that process, we are making ATP and NADPH. We're also converting water into oxygen because we're donating that electron. Then over in the sugar building reactions, which would be the Calvin cycle, we're converting CO2 into sugars, and in return also recycling the NADP and ADP necessary for the energy building or light reactions. So I like this graphic because it kind of does a good job of summarizing the importance of both sides. Okay, we'll keep cruising if you guys don't have any more questions. All right, so we're transitioning then into the land of DNA. So we'll talk a little bit about the structure of DNA, a little bit about DNA replication, and then we'll jump into transcription and translation. Okay, so structure of DNA, um, so you need to be familiar with the base unit. The base unit of DNA is a nucleotide and RNA for that matter. So all of our nucleic acids have nucleotides at their base um, for DNA. Ooh, we have a couple key factors that you should be familiar with. One, our bases, uh, so DNA is double-stranded, we know this. Um, they run anti-parallel, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a little bit. Um, but our two strands are connected together with hydrogen bonds. It's important to know that because in the scheme of bonds, hydrogen bonds are all actually relatively weak. You need to know that they're relatively weak because they're broken very frequently. Every time we go to replicate DNA, Every time we go to transcribe DNA, we need to break these bonds, okay? So it's important to know that they're held together with hydrogen bonds. Also important to know that the backbone out here that's keeping our DNA double helix together is a sugar phosphate bond, okay? So we have sugar groups and phosphate groups that are being bonded together, sugar phosphate, okay? And creating a really strong bond, much, much stronger than a hydrogen bond. And these are very, very infrequently broken. Um, and that's for the best because we don't want our DNA all of a sudden ripping apart, but we do want the middle to be able to be cut, okay, or unzipped, as we would more frequently say. So DNA has four bases, cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. Um, it is relatively good to know that uh, we have things called purines and pyrimidines. So the purine bases are adenine and guanine, and I always remember that because agriculture is pure, ag, A-G, Guanine is pure, so purines. Um, and you can see that those are a lot chunkier. The adenine and the guanine structures are just a lot bigger because they have um, both a hexene or both a six sided and a, a pent pentagon structure in them. Uh, whereas cytosine and thymine are the pyrimidines, uh, and they're a lot smaller. Um, and you can see that. And this helps us determine that our bases are always going to be cytosine pairing with guanine and adenine pairing with thymine. If adenine and guanine trying to pair together, we'd have really lumpy DNA because it would be way too bulky. So we need 
one bulkier pair, so an adenine or a guanine, paired with one lesser pair, so a cytosine or a thymine. Uh, and so that's that's part of our binding structure there with C's paired with G's and A's paired with T's. Um, but again, that's just the rationale behind it. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the base pair model. Okay. Something that is important to know is that DNA has direction. As I said, DNA is anti-parallel. I'll show you another version of that in a second. But DNA has a direction. Again, this is all review, but uh, it has a three prime end and a five prime end. And that comes from the number of the carbon molecule that's in the structure. Um, so here's our nucleotide and we have five carbons. So the carbons that count are this three prime carbon that's at the bottom that has the hydroxyl group paired to it. And then the five prime end that has the phosphate group attached to it. So you can see these are gonna to bind together really, really nicely through that sugar phosphate bond. So sugar, in this case ribose, this is actually an RNA base. Um, it would be deoxyribose if it was the DNA base. Um, but we have this ribose paired with a phosphate group uh, and the end that has the five prime sticking out is gonna be the five prime end. And the end that has the three prime end sticking out is gonna be the three prime end. So um, usually if I'm at school or at home, I'm, I'm at my like actual home. Philadelphia right now, not in Chicago. Um, I would I would show you with Legos, but DNA kind of gets built together like Legos. So you can see this like phosphate end, this five prime end is kind of bumpy. It has this big phosphate sticking off the top. So that's kind of like the bumpy end of Legos. And then the three prime end is quite smooth at the bottom of the sugar. And so you can picture when you're stacking Legos together, you have like five prime, three prime, and you stick a five prime, three prime to that. And then you keep building like that. So you'll have all the five primes in one direction and all the three primes in one direction. And the very top bumpy end would be your five prime end. And the very bottom smooth end would be your three prime end. And that's going to be continually built in that one direction with the bumpy end and the smooth end kind of fitting together. And that's exactly how DNA replicates. Um, and so we're going to be building in a fashion such as that. So when they come together then, our two strands, they're gonna be anti-parallel. So we have the five prime end of one end up top and the five prime end of the other end down at the bottom. And then we have um, the, you know, the three prime ends obviously in reverse as well. And that has to do with overcrowding, it has to do with the binding pairs. There's lots of different reasons for it. It does come into play a lot when we talk about DNA replication, that it is anti-parallel. And I've seen some tricky multiple choice questions that kind of um, have you have to think about um, direction before. Uh, and again, it's not overly complicated, but it's just something that you wanna keep in the back of your mind. Any questions about DNA structure or the anti-parallel nature of DNA or the base pairings? Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> well, definitely stop me if you do have any questions, but I'm really glad that that um, you're able to understand all my explanations. That's what I'm here for. All right. So the replication process. So you've probably heard this before, but DNA replicates in a semi-conservative model. We didn't always know that, but it is now the, the, the known way of replication. Um, and so I'm just showing you a couple different models just so you know how we came to this point. Um, and why the semi-conservative model is so important. Um, so you can see that on the left, this is how DNA actually replicates. So we have this pink parental strand. Basically what happens is we have our parental DNA, it gets broken apart. We'll talk about the enzymes that do that in a little bit, but the hydrogen bonds between the bases get pulled apart, okay? And then we, we fill in complementary strands to each of the parental strands, uh, and then that will continue to happen until we eventually split. And so then you'll see in our first round of replication, we have half parental pink DNA and then half blue new DNA, but we know it is gonna be 100% accurate because we're just matching a strand to a template, right? We're not creating any new DNA, we're just following along. And because A can only pair with T and C can only pair with G, we know that we have 100% efficacy in our replication. And after the second cycle, you can see that our colors are changing a little bit. But again, it's only because we're splitting the parental DNA and we're filling in new DNA and therefore having 100% uh, accuracy or very close to that. There's obviously errors in this, but we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Okay, that's how DNA actually replicates at once. It was thought maybe it was going to be a conservative model. So the parental DNA, we would have like a 100% new strand and a 100% old strand. Um, that doesn't really make a lot of sense because we're constructing a whole new double helix. A lot of room for error there. And then the dispersive model was that we have like some sort of mix of parental and then new kind of mixed in in chunks. 
Uh, and again, same problems there is that we're creating new DNA that could um, not match up with the parental. But because we're using the parental DNA as a template, we have really, really accurate DNA replication, hence the semi-conservative model, which we've now proven to be true. Okay. So what does this really look like? So a couple things that you need to know, and again, I'm not going into as much detail as I did the first time around that I explained this, because obviously that took a whole hour that time, and now I'm trying to explain this in 10 or 15 minutes. But if you're really interested in DNA replication, or if you're confused, I have an entire like 45 minute screencast that you can watch from a couple months back that will go into this in more detail. But the cursory overview, just to jog your memory, is that we have a couple different enzymes here when we're going to replicate DNA. Okay. When would we replicate DNA? Anytime we're going through cell division. Okay, so during interphase of cell division, we're replicating all of our DNA so that our two new daughter cells have identical copies of the parental DNA. Okay, so that's when this is going to be happening. So this is happening really frequently with your skin cells, with your hair cells, with cells that are rapidly dividing. So the first thing that happens here, which I actually don't have on this slide, I have it at the very end, so I'll just explain it to you. The DNA helicase, which is a really important enzyme, is going to go ahead and snip down the DNA double helix, hence helicase. Okay, so this enzyme snips down the double helix in, um, in the, it's called the replication fork. So it's going to be moving in one direction. It's going to be snipping hydrogen bonds, and therefore it's exposing these these two strands, which are going to become one half of a new daughter strand that used to be the parental strand. Okay, so DNA helicase is going to be moving in one direction. Actually, most replication processes will will have like a little replication bubble, and we'll have helicase moving in both directions. But in this example, it would be moving towards the right, and then we have a couple other enzymes that are going to come in and help this process. So one is primase, and primase is going to put down a little primer. That's primase. It's a little RNA primer. It's just a little starting block. You can think of it as like um, like a go sign or like a, a place for DNA polymerase, which is going to be the main enzyme here. I have all these enzymes written down on a slide in a couple slides so that you can just listen and kind of absorb and not feel like you have to have all this memorized. But DNA polymerase is going to be the enzyme ACE that makes the polymer DNA. Okay. DNA polymerase can't bind to single-stranded DNA, actually needs to bind on to something like this. So we put those primers down, and then DNA polymerase can bind, and DNA polymerase just moves along the DNA and places the corresponding complementary base pair down so that we have our new strand forming. Okay. So the, the interesting thing and the unique thing about DNA polymerase is it can only read in one direction. Okay. And it only moves in the direction of 3' prime to 5'. Prime. Okay. So this is going to lead to something called leading and lagging strands. You may have heard of Okazaki fragments before. It's one of my favorite words because it's fun. Um, but that's going to be in the lagging strand. And the reason is the DNA is anti-parallel and DNA polymerase can only move in one direction. So as you can see here, DNA polymerase is moving towards the right. And in this case, it's moving towards the replication fork. So as helicase continues to break these hydrogen bonds, DNA polymerase is going to continue to follow and copy this entire strand of DNA, absolutely no problem, okay? The problem is it can't do that on this bottom strand because DNA polymerase can only read from 3' prime to 5', five prime, just like you would read a book from page 3 to page 5, not from page 5 to page 3. The story would not make much sense, okay? So DNA polymerase is going to bind down here. It's going to be cruising from 3' prime to 5', prime, which has it moving towards the left, even though our replication fork is moving towards the right. So this is like the ultimate game of catch up, which is gonna lead to Okazaki fragments, a lagging strand of DNA replication, which always exists. It's just the way that it is because DNA is anti-parallel, okay? And the reason is, as DNA polymerase is moving in this direction towards the left, DNA or uh, helicase, right, which is unzipping, is moving in the opposite direction. So by the time DNA polymerase gets done, with replicating this section, helicase has moved all the way down here. And now we have a big old gap of DNA that needs to be replicated that's behind where our DNA polymerase is. So once DNA polymerase has finished this lovely strand, it has to hop all the way back and do it all over again. It's going to continue to be moving against the replication fork in the opposite direction, which is going to lead to, again, that lagging strand. So it reads from 3' prime to 5', prime, okay, just like you read a book. What that means is, though, and this is where students sometimes get confused, is that it's constructing the new strand of DNA from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So I'll write this out for you. DNA polymerase 
Leads DNA from three prime, oops, to five prime, which means the new strand it is constructing is made from five prime to three prime, right? Because DNA is anti-parallel. So if it's reading this parental strand from three prime to five prime, then the new strand that it's putting down is going to be five prime to three prime. Okay. So again, I always relate it back to reading a book, and students seem to remember that, and it sticks with them. So here's kind of what that looks like. So you can see, and this is actually flipped because now we have our replication fork going to the left. And as I said, we usually have one going in either direction. So what is sometimes a leading strand can be a lagging strand in a different situation and vice versa. Okay, but what you'll see here is we have these little RNA bits being put down. We have DNA polymerase, specifically DNA polymerase three if you wanna get technical, okay? DNA polymerase three is the one that's actually putting down the base pairs. And our bottom strand in this case is our leading strand because it's moving towards the replication fork from three prime to five prime. And our top strand you can see has been replicated in chunks called Okazaki fragments, okay, because it's moving away from the replication fork. So as the replication fork continues to open up, we have to continue to go back and refill in the opposite direction, okay? All right. Here are the enzymes you need to know. So if you're really striving for a five, you should know the difference between DNA polymerase three and DNA polymerase one. There's also a two, but it's a little less important. I know it's kind of funny that it's not on there. So DNA polymerase three is the enzyme that actually replicates the DNA strand by placing down the complementary bases. So when you really think about DNA polymerase, that's the DNA polymerase you're thinking of. DNA polymerase one is actually gonna come along after and proofread the DNA. But a lot of its proofreading actually has to do with the size of the, of the DNA base pairs. So let's say an adenine and a guanine found themselves bound together. DNA polymerase would able, be able to detect that as a giant bulge in the DNA. They'd therefore remove the, the incorrect base and replace it with the actual uh, correct one. DNA polymerase 1 also actually comes through and replaces the RNA primers. So these little red chunks that you can see here or the orange chunks that you can see here, we don't want RNA in our new DNA parent strand or in our new DNA um, daughter strands. Uh, so RNA polymerase 1 will come and actually remove those RNA primers and replace them with DNA so that we don't have any uracils or ribose sugars embedded into our new DNA. In the case, we talked about it unzips the DNA strand by breaking hydrogen bonds. Primase puts down the RNA primers so that DNA polymerase 3 can bind. We also have single-stranded binding proteins, I'm sorry, which I should have mentioned earlier, that actually hold open the separated DNA strands. If you think about like unwinding string, if you continue to pull on unwound string, uh, it doesn't really want to continue to be unwound, right? And if you didn't keep holding on to it, it would kind of loop itself back together. So single-stranded binding proteins are going to actually hold our DNA strand open and apart from one another so that they can't come back together, kind of like a magnet. Topoisomerase is another one if you're kind of striving for a four or five, but topoisomerase is going to be an enzyme that makes small cuts in the helix. Um, so actually in the sugar phosphate bond, it's one of the only times that we actually break that. Um, so they'll make small little nicks in the sugar phosphate bonds to help release tension. So again, if you're pulling like string, and there's a really good example of this, and I wish I had some string and I could show you. But if you're like pulling yarn and you continue to pull it apart, like the strands of it, um, you'll see a big bunch form at the top as a lot of tension forms as you're pulling apart um, the nice spiral of the yarn. And that tension that forms can be detrimental to DNA. So topoisomerase just helps relieve some of that tension by making little nicks in the sugar phosphate backbone. And then lastly, we have an enzyme called ligase, which ligates, which means to like stick together or glue uh, nucleotides to seal the sugar phosphate backbone. So once DNA polymerase one has come and replaced these segments with DNA, ligase will just come and glue these together. They'll come and glue the Okazaki fragments together and make sure that we have a nice strong DNA backbone. Uh, they'll also replace the sugar phosphate bond um, that um, has been nicked by topoisomerase. David, great question for the polymerases. DNA polymerase three is gonna be the one that actually reads and places down the corresponding base pairs. DNA polymerase one also is gonna scan along the DNA, but its job is going to be proofreading, editing, uh, and then sealing, or sorry, and then removing RNA primers. Cool, but DNA polymerase three is the one that's really doing replicating and, and pairing all the complementary bases the first time around.
Okay, are we good with DNA replication? Any other questions about that? It's an important one. There's a lot of enzymes involved, a lot of vocabulary. Okay, cool. So then our last, probably our last topic for tonight then will be gene to protein. So transcription and translation. Um, again, pretty important. I'll try to highlight the major differences um, between um, prokaryotes and eukaryotes with transcription and translation because that comes up on occasion. But for the most part, most of this you've probably learned in an intro biology class if you've taken one. Um, so there's, there's, it's usually, you know, relatively straightforward for students to understand. Okay. The purpose of gene to protein is to convert a message from DNA into protein. So DNA is the language of nucleotides, right? We've talked about this. Uh, and then we're moving into proteins, which are amino acids, which are a totally different macromolecule. So we're actually moving between two totally different macromolecules here via the processes of transcription and translation. Uh, and that actually has to do with the names of those things as well, which I can talk about. But in transcription, we're taking DNA, which we've just talked about replicating, Okay, and we're opening it back up again, so you'll see helicase is involved. We're splitting this apart, okay? We have a new enzyme, RNA polymerase, that's coming through and um, making a copy of the DNA, the template strand. So we're making an RNA copy. You can see that here. We have this transcript of RNA, okay? And uh, this RNA is now free to leave the nucleus, which is why we really make a transcript, because DNA cannot leave the nucleus, and we're gonna be making protein elsewhere in the cell. So now our transcript can leave. It's important to know, so transcription, to transcribe or be a scribe, literally means to copy. So there used to be people like the scribes of the Bible. Right? Picture copying, hand copying the entire Bible. That's how they made copies of the Bible, right? So open it up, scribe copies the entire book, okay? Is it gonna be absolutely perfect? Is it gonna be the same as the original? No, but it's a pretty good copy and it'll get the message across. It's in the same language, right? We're writing from one to another, but again, we're trying to keep everything exactly the same. Message stays the same, language stays the same. That's what's happening in transcription. Our message should be staying the same, and our language is staying the same. Even though we're moving from DNA to RNA, we're still living in the land of nucleotides, right? Where things heat up is with translation. So think about what translation means, right? It's usually like English to Spanish would be a translation, right? We're actually, the message, if you're translating correctly, should be the same, but the language is different, okay? So here we're getting the same message across, but we're switching into a different facet uh, of macromolecules. Now we're going from RNA, nucleotides, to amino acids and polypeptides and proteins. And proteins are the actual doers of the cell. DNA does nothing for you. It just codes for protein. Protein is the thing that actually does stuff. Makes you look the way you do, act the way you do, do the things you do, okay? All right, so some differences because we're gonna be talking about going from DNA to RNA. Is the central dogma the same as DNA replication? No, so we're talking about the central dogma now, which is transcription and translation. DNA replication is simply getting from DNA to DNA, which is what happens in cellular replication. Okay, so that's what we just talked about with DNA polymerase and helicase and topoisomerase and all those lovely things. That's DNA replication. The central dogma is what I'm talking about now with transcription and translation, which is going from DNA to RNA, the protein. So that's gonna be a different process, but still similarities involved, okay? So now that we're talking about going from DNA to RNA, we do need to talk a bit about the differences. Again, hopefully this is mainly review. DNA is double-stranded, RNA is single-stranded. We have a different sugar, a ribose versus a deoxyribose, ribose and RNA deoxyribose and DNA. And then instead of having thymine, we have uracil, which you can see is really similar, but we're actually missing a methyl group off of that. Um, and it's still gonna pair with A, uh, adenine, um, but it's slightly different, okay? So when we go through transcription, we're gonna be moving from DNA to RNA. Okay, so transcription, again, DNA to mRNA, messenger RNA. So it's sim similar to DNA replication in that we're splitting apart the parent strands. We're holding them apart just as we were. So now we have this enzyme RNA polymerase coming through, still moving in the same direction, um, which is creating in the five prime to three prime, reading in the three prime to five prime direction. So this RNA polymerase would be moving towards the right, okay? Um, but now we're creating this single-stranded messenger RNA. Um, so we have our coding strand and our template strand. And you can see down here, I guess I have to stop moving my mouse so you can actually see. 
on our template strand that we're reading from three prime to five prime, our polymerase is placing the complementary RNA base onto this molecule. Uh, the only differences that you can see is where we have A in the DNA, we're pairing a U now instead of a T. Okay, so we have A U G being paired from this T A C that you can see down here. So A pairs with T, U pairs with A. G pairs with C, and that's going to be the start of our messenger RNA, which can now leave the nucleus and go be translated into protein. Good so far? Okay, so that process again in and of itself is relatively simple, very similar to DNA replication, except now we're making an RNA transcript. It's single-stranded, we have a different base, but everything else is, is, is pretty normal, okay? Where things get slightly more complex and where um, we differ between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is with mRNA processing. So this is really important, so I wanna spend a little bit of time on it. So in eukaryotes, we go through this process of mRNA processing. And I've seen, actually as an AP question before, um, they've asked students to compare the length of mRNA in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. You would think eukaryotes were more complex, we probably have longer mRNA. We actually don't because when we transcribe a gene, we actually make free mRNA, okay? But it doesn't leave the cell yet. It's not mature yet, okay? We actually edit it a little bit before it leaves. There's a couple things that we do. One, we throw a five prime cap on the end. Uh, it's a methyl cap, um, and it tags on. It's usually like a guanine or something like that. And this cap is gonna help to guide this mRNA to the ribosome, which is where it needs to go to be translated. Okay. We also throw a three prime poly A, poly A meaning many adenine tail onto the three prime end. So three prime poly A tail, five prime methyl cap. What the three prime poly A tail does is it provides a bumper for our message, kind of like the bumper from of your car protects you. If you've ever seen those like bumper buddies, those like rubber things that you can put on the back of your car to protect your bumper, that's basically what this poly A tail is. Okay, so when mRNA leaves the nucleus. It actually gets inundated with, with enzymes that are trying to break it down. The reason for that is that a lot of viral genetic information is single-stranded. So our body's actually trying to protect us, but in, in turn, it can actually be destroying the message that we're trying to get across to our ribosomes. And so what this poly A tail does is it provides, again, a buffer. So when these enzymes come and start cutting away at the three prime end of the message, the message isn't changing at all. They're just cutting off adenines that are useless. It's not part of the coding region of the DNA, okay? What also happens is this middle message is gonna get snipped, okay? So we're actually gonna remove something called introns, which seems kind of counterintuitive because you would think they would stay in, but I remember it as introns stay in the nucleus, meaning they're not leaving. And exons are the ones that actually exit the nucleus, which means they become part of our mature mRNA. So that's kind of what's happening here. So we're removing sections and then we're condensing into a mature mRNA that has a five prime cap and a three prime tail that's gonna help guide it to the ribosome, okay? Now this is a kind of complicated process, but I wanna show you on the next slide why this is super important. So we have this pre-mRNA and here you can see red, yellow, green, and blue blocks, which are representing different parts of this. We can, we can splice this or cut it a couple different ways. There's something called a spliceosome that splices this. And if you've ever edited video before, you've seen a splicing tool, kind of where this name comes from, okay? And you can see that we can actually remove different sections and we, we'll code for different proteins, even though we have the same starting gene. So we actually have like about 20,000 genes. We can make about 100,000 different proteins from those 20,000 genes, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you know about splicing. So in the left-hand example, we've removed this green chunk, and we're now gonna make a different protein than in the right-hand sample where we kept the green chunk in and removed the yellow chunk. So these mRNAs now are gonna leave the cell and be translated into different proteins, even though they came from the same starting gene. So this gives us a lot more variety in our proteins from a fewer number of genes, okay? Any questions about that? Okay, cool. 
I don't know. Do you guys want me to jump into translation? I'm worried I'm going to zoom through it. I guess I can just zoom through it quickly. I know we only have about six minutes left. Translation is very basic. We have our mRNA. It's now left the nucleus. It has its five prime cap and its three prime poly A tail. It comes and binds to the ribosome. In eukaryotes, that usually happens in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It binds to the ribosome and it's here to be read. It's here to be read by tRNA, transfer RNA. Transfer RNA comes in and pairs strategically like a puzzle piece with corresponding base pairs of mRNA. And this is where we have codon charts, which I'm sure you've seen pretty frequently, where our tRNA, we have lots of different tRNAs that are gonna pair up with the codon. So here we have AGU is the codon that's coded for in the messenger RNA. If I go over here, A, first base G, second base U, serine. Okay, so this tRNA molecule dropped off a serine amino acid, which is going to be formed into a peptide, a polypeptide, which is a fancy word for a chain of amino acids, which will eventually be folded into a 3D protein structure. So the DNA is read in these triplet codon patterns. That's what we call these three groupings, a codon, by an anticodon, which is on a corresponding tRNA molecule. And depending on what the codon has on it, the tRNA molecule that matches will drop off that particular amino acid, which will be formed into the polypeptide to make a specific protein. David, great question. The things that are getting spliced is the pre-mRNA. So what we think of as, yeah, exactly, introns are getting spliced out. So that's part of mRNA. So all of those are just like that one long mRNA transcript. We just take out the introns, we put together the exons, and we get the mRNA that actually leaves the cell. So that's the part that differentiates like regular bio from AP bio is knowing kind of that process. Um, and again, the, would that be a stop codon? So AUG is our start codon. AUG codes for methionine, which is always gonna be the first thing that's coded for in a polypeptide. Stop codons are going to be at the very end. Um, we have three of them. We can see them here. It's UAA, UAG, and UGA. All of those are not going to code for an amino acid. So instead of an amino acid being delivered, that protein will actually stop being synthesized at that point. Oh, that is such a great little analogy. Exons are kept keeping exciting people around. I love that. Um, that's a great way to remember the difference between introns and exons. Thank you for sharing. I have to bring that back to my kids. They'll be pleased. Okay. Um, here's just another example of translation. So there's three major steps, initiation, elongation, and termination. So here's AUG, which is always going to be the first codon. It's where the ribosome knows to start translation. We'll see the anticodon binding here, and we're dropping off methionine, which is always going to be the first amino acid in a polypeptide. Okay, and then we have more in the elongation phase. We have more tRNAs dropping off the corresponding amino acids, and you can see those up here. They're being binded together with what we call a peptide bond, okay, for polypeptide, which is again going to eventually be folded into a three dimensional protein. And then the last thing that's going to happen, we have UAA here, which is one of our three stop codons. And instead of a tRNA molecule binding, we have a release factor, which is going to release this polypeptide, which will then allow it to be folded into its 3D shape and go do its protein things. Any questions about this? Translation's simpler just because it's there's not much different between like your regular intro to bio class um, and AP. Um, but there's definitely some differences in transcription. So I'm glad we got to talk about that. Also, we really, really timed this out perfectly. Well, there's a, you know, a different codon chart in case you're used to seeing this. Usually on the AP exam, they give you the square one though, so make sure you know how to use it. That's really all I have though. We, we really timed this out perfectly. Does anyone have any last minute questions? Okay, well, because we timed that out so perfectly, next week we're going to talk about genetics. Um, I may also start talking about the human body a little bit because I want to make sure that we get um, through those three major systems, nervous, immune, and um, endocrine system before the AP exam. Um, and again, let me post really quick um, the link to where you can sign up for Fiveable Plus just because if you want to rewatch replays, if you're just joining us, or if you 
have joined us just recently, but you want to watch older videos, you want more information on any of these things, I will bust truly really the way to go. $35, you can watch all my replays, you have access to all my slides, all that good stuff. But if no one has any other questions, I hope you have a great night. I hope you have the best rest of your spring break if you're currently on spring break. Um, definitely make sure you're resting. It's going to be a big three-week push by the time we get back to school. I know my students are ready for it three weeks. And then we'll be done with this beast of an exam. You guys can feel great um, and hopefully get some great scores back in July. Uh, we'll bring your friends next week. We have lots of fun things to talk about. Make sure you bring your questions. And I really appreciate you guys all tuning in tonight.